All right. Um, my name is Jason Ford, CTO of Blackmesh. Uh, been doing this for, uh, well, security pretty much all my life um, for the most part. But um, some of the challenges that we see and kind of things we've gone through with our customer base, um, try, kind of want to give it here. I'm not going to be talking about our customer base. I'm going to be talking about really what we do per se. I'm going to talk more about frameworks, which if, um, it, it, if I say the word security and you get excited, you're going to love this. If you go, oh my god, it's security, I don't want to deal with that. Um, I'm probably going to bore you for 30 minutes, but you can bear with it. Um, so some background for, uh, for myself, like I said, uh, I've been kind of done security since 97. Uh, I started in, in Fed Civ space in the FBI headquarters building uh, and then kind of went around the f uh, civilian sector for a while. Um, us as an entity, we're uh, P PCI DSS certified uh, for level one. Uh, we have uh, FISMA moderate, we have FedRAMP moderate as a platform and it is infrastructure. Uh, we were founded, I'm one of the founders in 2003, um, and we have basically SLED customers, everything commercial side as well um, from that side. So that'll be the last black mesh thing you see up here, besides the logo in the corner. That's going to be it. All right, so security versus compliance. I mean, uh, a lot of you uh, probably out there are... Um, kind of familiar with this concept, maybe you aren't, but you know, security is how you actually do those, those things, um, how, how you actually implement those controls. Uh, compliance is a snapshot of how you've implemented those controls. Um, so from that snapshot, you know, it really doesn't give you a, a holistic picture of what's going on. It's just how it looked at that point in time when you looked at it, right? So, um, you know, but security is that framework that you actually see everything uh, that is associated with either that system or that, that plan. Um, some pretty notable things in government, um, for at least this space anyway. Uh, you know, White House runs a, a version of Drupal. Um, you know, we actually host the Department of Energy, uh, their main website, uh, Department of Ed, obviously, uh, recovery.org, drought.org, or drought.gov, drought uh, recovery.gov, Homeland Security runs it. There's a lot of them. So, point is, is that it, it is a secure platform, and that's one of those things that a lot of people seem to. Uh, have to fight a lot of, um, especially in the government summit yesterday. Uh, we talked a lot about that, um, how to present Drupal as being secure. Um, and that's that's really the, that's the hardest part, right? And if you can get over the Linux part and you can say, well, Linux is secure, you're doing that with Stigs in the, in the DISA space, you're doing that with other things as well. Um, why shouldn't it be other open source technologies like Drupal, like other CMSs uh, uh, to be accepted in that same framework? So frameworks, really, at the end of the day, there's a ton of them, right? So, but the, here's the main ones. Um, you know, PCI for credit card. Uh, FISMA was in 2002. Federal, uh, the basically federal uh, government decided that they wanted to actually have some kind of compliance around that. So they created that off of NIST 853 framework. Um, NIST is the, uh, if you're not familiar with them, they're the entity that, that advises the government and others on how to secure their, um, not only their IT infrastructure, but all their infrastructure. Um, financial, everything else. Uh, ISO standards are more global. Um, you know, HIPAA is obviously health, healthcare. FedRAMP's virtual version of, of FISMA at the end of the day. Um, and then DISA has its own thing as well in the, in the, in the DOD space. You know, really comes down to just this, <laughs> compliance in general comes down to just these six steps. I know it's, it's, uh, it's hard to boil down compliance into, into anything. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really just these things. So. Going through, figuring out what you have to actually monitor on, what you have to report on, you know, how do you assess those controls, how do you actually implement them, and then you monitor those things after you implement them. At, at the end of the day, it's as simple as that. How you actually have to do that process is not so simple, right? And that's what we usually run into, and that's our problems, right? So kind of going um, into a couple of these compliance frameworks in a little more detail, I'm going to focus more on FISMA and FedRAMP more than anything else, just because... Um, those seem to be kind of the, the harder ones to do. PCI is also difficult to do as well. HIPAA is kind of a joke compared to the other ones, honestly. Um, but from a framework perspective, you know, like I said, FISMA's, FISMA came out in 2002. Um, it was based on as 853 framework from NIST. Um, at that point in time, all systems actually had to get an authority to operate an ATO based upon how the system looked at that point in time of implementation. Um, so kind of some of those requirements, um, you have to have a system inventory, you have to basically say what your network diagram looks like, what's the system look like, you know, basically get all these things in place, um, and then figure out what your risk factors are from that, and then try to figure out, all right, if these are my risks, are those acceptable risks or not? 
Um, and it doesn't matter if this is on the software side or if this is on the hardware side or any of those sides. Um, it's all of it, including yourself as a human in, in, in the system, right? You're part of this. Um, whether you can be spearfished attack, for instance, and compromise the system. Um, and then you go through a certification process and you go into continuous monitoring. I'm kind of flying through this pretty quickly, but I could, I mean, we spent literally eight hours yesterday talking about security and compliance. Um, and we didn't even scratch, scratch the surface. 30 minutes here is hardly justice for it, but just want to kind of give a high-level overview. Um, within those, those, uh, that framework, there's different uh, categorizations. So uh, you can have low, moderate, or high, um, and it depends upon what that system needs to have. So if you have a high system, for instance, um, as I always use the example, if you're in the space of um, energy, for instance, and you have nuclear work codes, then that's obviously going to be high, right? And there's going to be a lot more controls wrapped around that, whereas a low is going to be similar like a public-facing website that you may not even collect data on, right? It might be just brochure, like a brochure site or something like that. Um, it is based upon, you know, uh, FIPS compliance. If you've done any federal compliance work at all or anything in the security world, you know FIPS already today. Um, it is the way that the encryption happens and how those things are encrypted, whether that data is at rest or whether that is in transit, uh, and how you are interacting with that, um, with, with that system to actually see that data, whether it's in the clear or not. Uh, just a couple more, like security controls, things of that nature. Uh, so how we categorize these things. Uh, all those things get categorized into, into an SSP or system security plan. Those, those things are things that you have to write as a system owner. So you as a developer, you have to write an SSP whether you know it or not. Um, you may be answering questions for your security person, which then they're taking those answers and then writing that plan out. Really it's just saying how your system works. So if you're saying you use two-factor authentication for single sign-on, you have to say that you do that and how do you do that, right? Do you have LDAP behind that? Do you have something else? Um, are you using CAPTCHA you know, for your forms? All that stuff matters, right? And you have to document those things. Um, once you have all that documented, then it goes into um, those control families, um, which I think I'll talk about in the next slide. But um, basically, we have the, we, there's a really well known format template for FISMA, um, but it's pretty lenient from the perspective of, of how you write those things. It's really just a Word doc with these control families inside of it. Um, then you kind of go through the risk assessment, like I said, trying to figure out vulnerabilities, threats, no different than what you do for Drupal updates or any other CMS, um, and trying to figure out what, uh, what actually is going to impact this site and how someone's going to actually attack it. Uh, and then from that, you either do compensating controls to basically deal with those attacks and mitigate that risk, or you figure out a way to write the control or put a better system in place to deal with it. <coughs> Lastly is the independent assessment. This is the most painful part. Um, you have an auditor sit with you for long periods of time, and then they ask you to take screenshots of things and give them screenshots so you can see all this stuff happening. So you can actually verify that you say that if you change, you have password complexity turned on in your application, show me, right? Screenshot that. And that's going to be part of the compliance piece of it. So once you have the certification, um, the certification comes out of all of that stuff, that assessment, and all that stuff goes to, um, usually it's the, uh, the head of security for that agency, typically in FISMA space, because um, the agency typically de deals with that. Um, and then once they have that and they look over things, and if the risk is acceptable to them, acceptable to them, then they will um, give you an authority to operate or an ATO from that piece. Um, and that's the authorization piece. So FISMA requirements from the perspective of, you know, continuous monitoring is the last bit of this, as we saw from the first piece, before we move on to something other than FISMA. Continuous monitoring is just ongoing what you're looking at. So do you do penetration testing? Do you do credential scans? Do you do, um, uh, do you actually update your antivirus? Do you actually see, if you have intrusion detection on your stuff, do you actually update those policies? Things of that nature. Um, do you actually rotate your passwords? Is there logs for that? All these things go in that continuous monitoring bucket. Auditors, whenever they come in and look at you, um, they will ask you for all this data. That's part of the evidence, right? So. That's the important bit to actually get that recertification piece at the bottom. If you, don't, um, if you don't do all that stuff, then they flag you, and either you have a very short amount of time to remediate that, or you lose your ATO, is what it comes down to. So that was all FISMA side. FedRAMP is, you know, FISMA is really for, um, it's a one-time uh, authority to operate for that system, how it was deployed. If you make any major changes to that, then you have to change the whole thing and redo it again. FedRAMP was uh, you know, uh, an ATO once, and then you can operate it 
multiple times. So, and it's also virtual versus physical. So FISMA is like physical servers, bare metal servers. FedRAMP is all virtualized, so that would be Docker containers, cloud stuff, things of that nature. Same kind of concepts, but at the end of the day, what they've done is they've changed some of the um, uh, control sets to deal with virtualization and multi-tenancy. So FedRAMP is, uh, FISMA is done at the agency level, so whatever agency you're dealing with. FedRAMP is done at the GSA level, so GSA owns that program. Uh, the PMO office is run by Matt Goodrich uh, currently. He and, uh, and his staff basically deal with all these incoming you know, packages from all these different cloud service providers. Uh, and I'll get into some of that here in a minute. So anybody who's doing virtual services for the government, you have to go through this process. Um, so that includes infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or software as a service. So if you'd come up with a Drupal platform and say you wanted to offer multi-site, multi-tenancy for multiple agencies inside of something, you'd have to be a SaaS provider. And then you'd have to find either someone who is an infrastructure or a platform service provider in order to help you with that. Or you do it all yourself, either way. Um, it was basically geared at having a standardized approach for, for offering virtual services, which didn't exist until this program happened four years ago. Um, and like I said, there's software, uh, platform, and infrastructure as a service. So the whole idea and concept of this was that you can use it by multiple agencies. So for instance, for us, you know, if, if, we, got, if we got FedRAMP certified, another agency could actually use our ATO and not have to go through that whole process again, unlike with FISMA. Right? FISMA is laborious. It's tedious, it's all those things. So having, having that ability to use, leverage that ATO um, off of another agency means that you get to inherit a bunch of things that you don't actually have to go through again and want to cry yourself to sleep at night as you're trying to deal with this. Um, two, two methods, um, there's the Joint Accreditation Board um, or the JAB, um, and then there's agency sponsorship. Um, agency sponsorship is the fast path to this because the, the agency that in question that gives you the ATO is actually responsible for doing the continuous monitoring efforts with you, um, whereas the JAB is done by volunteers inside the GSA. So there's three um, high-level security officers from different agencies that volunteer their time to the GSA. How many government agencies do you know or uh, officials want to actually volunteer time to read 1,200-page documents? You know, it's a long process, and, and it's awful. <laughs> I mean, it, it's bad. Um, there's about 100 CSPs right now in the JAB queue. Um, average time to get through that is about two to four years, depending upon how fast you move. Um, and then agency sponsorship can be much, much less. Same kind of things that we talked about before um, on the FISMA side and the requirements. Um, again, hardware, software, network diagram, data flow. Data flow is new, right? So how does your data flow through your application? Where does it see things encrypted? Where is it at rest? Things of that nature is all important here. And then on top of that, if you have to have a trusted internet connection or a tick um, the, to talk from your agency to your system, that all goes into that data flow section as well. Uh, again, same thing, FIPS 199 uh, based. Uh, it's actually dash two now. Um, so how those things are encrypted, how those things get pushed around. Um, right now, there's only low and moderate in FedRAMP. There are no highs. Um, GSA doesn't know how to deal with it. Um, not only that, no one wants to put high data in, in cloud service providers these days. Um, there's uh, an equivalent cloud in DISA space, which I'll get to in a minute. It's DISA's actual cloud is, is actually high, but it is inside of the DOD, um, and only DOD people can use it. Uh, so again, security controls, again, 853 framework. FISMA and FedRAMP look a lot alike. Um, the controls are written in different words, but they mean the same thing. You know, access control is still access control. Password complexity is still password complexity. How you do incident response is still how you do incident response. It's the same thing. So if you do one, it's pretty easy to transition to the other. Not, not super easy, but easy enough, right? Um, low systems typically have about 120 controls. And controls are broken up into those control families like I talked about before, and I'll just show those in a minute. Um, modern systems, roughly about 300. Um, and that that's before an agency can actually add more stuff to you, so you can actually get more stuff. Same kind of thing with FISMA. You know, system security plan, you've got to write that. Uh, the, the, just the template is 350 pages before you put any words to it. Once you start writing paragraphs and paragraphs for each control, um, you know, it, it, it can go over 1,000 pages. Ours is currently about 1,200. So as time moves forward, you keep adding to it. So you have to have these support, this supporting documentation. It's just not answering the controls is enough. Um, you have to do things like um, have a user guide on how to use your system, right? How, to, uh, how do you do privacy control? How do you do encryption at rest? How do you do um, rules of behavior? How do you do security training? 
all those things are attachments on top of that. So you're starting to see it's, it's a long, complex system of stuff to deal with, right? And that's why it takes so long to get through it. Because usually the first time you go through it, you don't get it right. You have to go back and modify and edit those things. Risk assessment, again, very similar to, and you're seeing a lot of commonalities between FISMA and FedRAMP. Um, figure out those threats, those vulnerabilities. Again, do the, do the risk analysis. Here's the different part. So the assessment's not done by the agency. It's done by a 3PAO or a third-party auditing agency or organization. Um, those are all certified by the GSA. So they're actually commercial companies that go and get certified. Uh, there's about 30 of them today. But here's the difference is that not all of them will do accreditation. Some of them will help you write your documentation. Right? So they focus on the, the upfront, how do you get your rules of behavior done? How do you get all your documents in place? How do you actually get a successful package to go through the first time? Because it's costly and it's, it's difficult to do. So again, certification authorization, again, very, very similar to FISMA. Um, either you get the authorization granted by the JAB or by the sponsoring agency you have. Um, if you get it from the JAB, you get a PA or a provisional authorization. If you get it from the agency, you get an ATO, which is an authority to operate. Continuous monitoring, again, it's kind of the same things here. Um, we, we, you have to do these things um, more often than I wish to, wish to say because it's really a lot. Um, but at the end of the day, what, we're, what I'm trying to show here is that you're always going through this agile environment of trying to figure out security. Um, so all these things that you guys are doing to develop code, it's the same, same process for security, which it can, be, um, it can be a difficult task to try to find everything and try to plug every hole whenever they change all the time, right? So again, kind of showing here, you know, infrastructure and paths for FedRAMP, um, you know, you, you have this ATO for CSPs and then for, for like what we're showing here is like different dev shops would have stuff on top of this or applications or system owners in this case. So your system has to go through, if you're using a platform or an infrastructure service and you're not doing multi-tenancy inside your application, then you can use FISMA for your application. You don't have to go through this FedRAMP process, which is much, much lighter. And on top of that, you get to inherit um, a lot of controls out of, um, out of the, the CSP's um, package in order to, to leverage that for your uh, SSP for your application. All right, so that's FedRAMP. All right, as I'm seeing time at 10 minutes. All right, so this is the next one is DISA. Um, DISA has their own thing, <laughs> which is awesome because that makes things so much easier to understand. Um, you have basically uh, impact levels in DISA space. So some of these translate over, some of them don't. So FedRAMP moderate um, will translate into DISA impact level two. A FedRAMP plus, which I haven't talked about yet, which is additional 25 controls on top of the FedRAMP moderate, will translate into a, into a DISA four, impact level four. What usually comes out of from four to five is you have to go through background checks, you have to have facility clearances, you have to have a security officer on, on site. I mean, it's a whole laundry list of things. Plus, you have to have encryption between all your stuff between the agency. The list goes longer and longer. Um, and then there's actually a six as well. I'm not aware of a six that's out there today. So some of the basic controls, I just want to kind of pull out some of the stuff that would apply to Drupal. Um, in particular, or any CMS, really. So some of these things, like AC7, failed login attempts, account lockout. So if you need to lock out a system, right, so you need to do that. You need to log it, right? Not only do you have to do it, you have to actually uh, report on that. And then you have to have some kind of automated alerting system saying that that happened, right? Um, session activity, right, AC11, same thing. You have to make sure that the, the inactivity timer actually meets those times. So if you have a session logout, it's not only for Drupal, but it's also for PHP sessions, right, it's both. So whereas Drupal, you have to worry about one thing, but you also have to worry about the undercarriage, which may or may not work the same way you want until an auditor finds it, right? And then you have to fix it. <laughs> and then you go into remediation, and then you do a POEM, or a, um, basically that's an after action piece that you have to fix those, those deficiencies. So some Drupal modules, we kind of talked about these yesterday um, in pretty heavy context in some ways. Paranoia, the first one, was the one for D7. It was used heavily. Um, it hasn't been updated for D D8 yet. Um, security review is the one it has been. Um, the guys at Civic Actions have been doing a ton of work on that. Um, and we actually came out of yesterday talking about how we're going to, or how they're going to, along with other people that are in the room, come forward with a plan to basically push that uh, even faster through D8. 
Um, these are just a bunch of ones that you can kind of see. Some of them are updated for, for eight and some aren't. So session limit obviously gets you past that AC control, right? Password policy, same thing. You want to have compl complex pa passwords. Um, you know, and, and the last one should go without saying, just upgrade your stuff. I mean, it's, I mean, I know it's a pain. I mean, upgrade your, your, your modules, upgrade core, keep it upgraded. I mean, that's, that's the shortest way not to get into a remediation step, right? And do that with having some continuous, um, uh, not continuous monitoring, but actually tracking your changes, um, change review, that kind of thing. You have to go through that process as well and show that, that you can document that. All right, that's all the federal stuff. I think. Um, so now on to quickly through uh, PCI and HIPAA. So PCI, I'm sure you guys have dealt with credit cards at some point in time in your life. You probably have a couple in your pocket, you know, that kind of thing. You bought things. So in the service provider industry, it's PCI DSS is the, is the thing. So it is um, this version of PCI that they just came out with today, or that this list last, uh, I think it was end of last year. Um, they did a major revamp of, of the control sets and it makes, makes it actually more difficult to go through. But that's a good thing because now credit cards are, in theory, less easy to compromise. Um, very different from the perspective of how you know, FISMA and FedRAMP work. You basically get a report of compliance or a ROC and then you have a QSA or a qualified security assessor come in um, and then you get an AOC, which is the same thing as an ATO. Right, so that process is pretty straightforward. And you can do this for your application, you can do this for your infrastructure, you can do this for your platform. It's, it's all different things, and I'm sure you guys have uh, filled out a SOC queue before, um, if you've done PCI before. Healthcare side, very, very uh, light compared to the other ones. Um, you know, HIPAA, HIPAA non-high trust is, is uh, you know, a very easy process to go through compared to PCI and the other ones. Um, still has sensitivity to data because you're dealing with PII, right? So um, the, the harder part is just making sure that that stuff is encrypted. That, that's the end of the day. Make sure things are encrypted both at rest and in transit. Um, there's a basically the agreement that you have to sign between you and the, the person that you're dealing with this is a BAA. It's literally just a contract form, two, usually two pages long, has some stuff in there, some stipulations saying what you have to deal with and what you're gonna deal with and how you're gonna deal with it, and then has some incident response stuff inside of it. That's about it, um, pretty straightforward. So tools. Um, so OpenSCAP is out there. Um, God help you if you try to write policies to it. It's a pain, um, but it is there. Uh, it is customizable. Uh, it is open source. You can install it on any Red Hat system just by telling me, you know, yum install, you know, app get for anything in Ubuntu. Um, it is maintained by NIST, so you can get some policies and some control sets out of them by default. You can write your own. You can create regression testing. If you want to dump it out of Jenkins and then do code review, all that stuff is all here. Um, we talked about yesterday, um, the code review module on Drupal actually hooking uh, OpenSCAP into that so it's a module. So you, whenever you do a checkout from Jenkins or something happens, some event fires, you can actually run some of these policies on top of that and then that can fail the build. Um, things of that nature is kind of what it seems like is the, the process. Um, kind of going into another tool is Nessus. Uh, if you've never heard of them, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, but they Tenable is the name of the company that owns it. Uh, it is commercial, it's fairly inexpensive, but at the end of the day, what it does is it basically does credential scans or scans on your database or your code for vulnerabilities. Um, you can use them for, you have to have an ASV or a, a certified um, uh, scanning provider actually scan your code uh, or scan your site every, uh, I forget how, how frequent, it's, it's pretty frequent. Um, but they are actually one of those ASVs. So is Qualys, if you've ever dealt with Qualys before, those type. So in DOD space, STIGs are popular, um, which are awful. Um, again, if you haven't got a reoccurring theme, security is not fun. Um, it, it's consumed my life for many, many years, and as much as I love doing it, it, it still is. Um, it's still a challenge in, in every every aspect. Um, they are DOD disabacked. You can download these things. You can apply these templates to the boxes. In the Linux space, only Rail, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, it has STIG templates for it. Ubuntu, Debian, the, nothing. I mean, there's no, you can write your own, but they won't be certified. Um, in Windows space, there's obviously stuff for Windows. Um, again, you can go look at these things if you want. There's also a stick viewer out there that someone wrote that you can actually try to you know, kind of figure out what those things are. Um, again, it is, it is extensive. 
logging is obviously something we, I kind of talked about a good bit here. Um, some tools that you can have open source land is Elk, right? So Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana. Um, the hard part there is you have to know how to do Kibana. The Logstash stuff, Elasticsearch is fairly simple. Um, Splunk has you know an enterprise and a free version. You can set up alerting inside that. You can do all kinds of fun stuff inside there to basically uh, automate your your life into uh, your your inbox into a point where you have so many emails coming in for alerts that um, you won't be able to do anything else. <laughs> um, and then OSSEC is the other tool that you can kind of use, which is um, I think Trend Micro is the one that backs that one. Uh, it's basically host-based IDP, so you can actually see file file integrity and things of that nature. Um, and also does host-based IDP from a firewall perspective as well. All right, I think I actually did 35 slides in 30 minutes, so that was around time. So three minutes left before the next people come up. Any questions? If you could, stay at the mic so we can get it recorded. Sweet. I bored you to death. All right. Cool. Thank you. How's everyone doing today? Good? So how many of you shop online? Pretty much the whole room. I've been asking that question for 10 years, and over the last 10 years, obviously, more and more of the room has said yes to that question, to the point that I was just driving by my local sports chalet, and it was going out of business, because I realized that I probably haven't walked in there in two years, it's just like everyone else. And what I've also realized is it works the same way with user experience and the websites you shop on. So you probably, how many of us, so you all shop online now, how many of you have your favorite websites to shop on? Right, because you've decided that's the user experience you like, and it's come down to, it used to be, I don't want to get in my car or drive to a store anymore, it's too inconvenient. It's now come down to a matter of seconds, right? Well, this website is two seconds faster than this website, so I like that user experience better. I'm going to go on that website. And that's where we've come to. And studies show that you convert more on sites that are faster and where the user experience is better. And user experience is more than just you know, the look and feel of the website. It's, there's a, a piece to that which is just the passage of time and the patience we've all lost over the last number of years waiting for a website. So it's become very important for your website to have high performance. Drupal, which is open source and isn't great, and the greatest benefit of Drupal is that it's open source, but it's also its greatest weakness, right? Because anyone can do whatever they want to it. They can customize it in however they want, which is in the right hands an amazing thing, and in the wrong hands it can cause more problems than I've seen over my career. So even though Drupal Speed can set your revenue on fire, it can also slow you down and cost you a lot of money because of it. So how does performance impact your business? Did you know a one second delay reduces conversions by 7%? This was a, uh, they looked at this a couple years ago and I saw the research and it's pretty amazing because we were talking about what could a 
essentially be up to almost two and a half million dollars a year annually for a site that sells $100,000 a day, which is a lot of money. And what we're going to do here today is I'm going to start here at the beginning going through some of these numbers generically, but then we're going to show a case study in real world examples of one of our clients to show you how, you know, the better your performance is, the more people come to the site and the better conversion rates you'll have. Uh, is Mark in the room from Perfectly Posh? So the case study we're going to do is for our client Perfectly Posh. We have one of their employees here with us. And Christian's going to come up in a minute after we go through this. And we'll walk through the case study of bringing them from another hosting company over the platform and the success they've had on the performance side. And what really is important to understand and to know, that performance isn't just related to the hosting company and it's very important, but as important is the partnership not only amongst the client, the hosting company, and the developer. In Posh's example, they are the, also the developer. They do it internally. But having a partner for the development side is just as important. So what you'll see is as page loads times increase, you have lost opportunity. And again, we'll be able to show this in real world examples with Posh. What was happening on the other hosting company is as they had a rush on the flash sale, what was happening is people were not coming because it would take seven, eight, nine, ten 10 seconds. And as more people showed up, the time to check out was getting more and more because of the structure they were looking at. So people were bouncing. And they would have these sales that should last an hour or two, and they were lasting three, four, six, eight, 24 hours because of the fact that the site was slowing down. So conventional wisdom today, we were talking about seconds, says that you should have a sub two second page load time, which personally I think is unrealistic because of how complicated websites are today. I think it should be closer to about four seconds, and I'll explain that to you in a second. So what we did, do you know, does anyone know what the IR500 is? That's the top 500 largest e-commerce websites in the world. So I spent some time reviewing them, and the average page load time in 2014, so when I did this, this was a couple years ago, was 3.67 seconds. And actually what's happened since then is it's actually gotten slower. So what are the ways, some of the ways it can get slower? I'll explain. I had a client call me once and says, my website's slow. I said, let me take a look at it. And I bring it up, and they do a trace of the site, and it was 1,050 calls to generate the page, something like 17 seconds to, to load the page. And he sold books. And I said, how many books do you have? What, how many, what's your SKU count? He said, 1,000. I said, you see the scroll on the bottom that shows about six books? If you scroll through it, it's actually loading all 1,000 books. What you need to do is have a lazy load so it just shows the six that are there, and as you scroll, it'll load the others. He did that, and it took it from 17 seconds down to about one and a half seconds. But these are all things that you have to be cognizant of from both the hosting side and what things you can do there, like caching and compression, but also just as important are things like the number of calls on the web page, the size of the web page, all of these things in concert are what makes the user experience so great. And as I mentioned, to really do this correctly, you have to have a true partnership. You can't just have someone you hire and say, OK, you want a hosting company, and I'm just going to walk away. I give them the site. They're hosting it. From there on out, it's their problem. Or I've hired a development company. They're supposed to develop my site. It's a partnership. And that partnership doesn't just include the client. It includes Drupal if you're choosing that as your, as your application. It includes the Drupal developer. And it includes the hosting partner. And what you really need to do is work together in order to have the best experience. So when we went to Posh, one of the big things we said in Dallas, who's not here, that's, that's Mark's boss. They came to us. We architected a custom stack built for them because of the unique way they do things. And I'll explain it in a second. But they, they needed someone that could scale very quickly. And their current hosting company 
couldn't do that. They were either having a lot of downtime or they were having longer and longer page load time. So what we were able to do was architect a custom stack just for them, which is important. So what did Perfectly Posh do? They have something called a splurge sale once a month. They have 45,000 independent consultants who all get an opportunity to buy one item. So they have 25,000 units, and that one item might go on sale from $25 down to six, seven, eight, nine dollars And they all want to rush to the site and buy this before it runs out, because once it's gone, it's gone for good. So what was, this was causing was a, a, a rush to the site, but that rush to the site was crashing the site or slowing the site down. So something that should have sold out in a couple of hours was taking multiple days to sell out. So they went live with us on March after we custom engineered a plan for them. And after the first splurge, these were the feedback we were getting from their independent consultants. We got things like magical, easiest splurge ever. All of these things that can show you pretty easily the problems they were having on the other hosting company. And what was the problem? They were throwing hardware at the problem, and they were throwing the hard, wrong hardware at the problem. So there was really multiple issues. You can see at one point they had 20 web heads. At some points they had 30 and 40 web heads. I can tell you we're currently at 10, and we're not running out of resources yet. I think we finally hit the, we, we might add one more we now. An we added an 11th. But they were at 30 or 40. They were throwing the wrong hardware at it. It's crazy. So what did they do when they moved to platform? So I'm going to bring Christian up now, and he's going to walk us through uh, what we did in the different phases to get them from having all the problems they had on the other guys to the most magical splurge ever. <laughs> all right. Hi, everyone. So the, the typical deployment we do for an enterprise uh, hosting solution is that we have three hosts all load balanced across each other for both web requests, for database requests, and for caching and for um, search if you use a search service for like solar for example. Um, with Posh we wanted to scale out beyond that because they had so many requests coming in we knew that they were typically at 20 web heads with their previous solution and so we needed to do something slightly different and what we did is go through their requirements, look at where they were bottlenecked in terms of their performance reporting from their previous host and, and worked out a solution that we thought would work. Um, but we left a lot of time to plan and look at that solution and evaluate it and test it before the go live point because we wanted to have success out of the gate. And, and we didn't want to have to provision two of these environments to do testing in the future because that would have been very expensive for them. And, and so we left some space for us to use the production environment in a test phase before we deployed. So. Let's see, I'll leave this up here for a sec. Um, exactly. So the first thing we did is we decided because we need to load balance across more web heads, we'll deploy an additional set of web heads that are all the same size, so it's easy for Elastic Load Balancer on AWS to work with. And then we left the core, what we call the core servers, the original three hosts, were just used for the database, for caching, and for solar. They weren't serving any more web requests. And the main reason we did that is both for the load balancing and because we wanted them to use the full amount of CPU and I.O. We put those hosts on AWS instances which are specific for storage. They were using SSDs rather than the, the metal-based um, network file system called EBS on AWS because we wanted high I.O. performance. They had seen a lot of database trouble on their previous hosting company. And so by splitting those, we were able to optimize each set of hardware for the performance results we needed. Um, we also planned to use Redis for caching, which is what we typically support. They had been using memcache. This will, we'll come back to this later. It becomes important. Um, and we decided to add Fastly for a full page cache. Um, the advantage of Fastly being that we could add Essentially, Fastly is Varnish as a service. It allowed them to implement a few things in a custom VCL file, a custom Varnish file, that allowed them to do configuration where pieces of their page would be loaded via the cache, and then other pieces would be lazy loaded into the page via AJAX. So this is what the system, the system normally just has 
the three hosts that you see in yellow, green, blue. And those are all three hosts, app123 and db123 would be all together. But by moving those out, we were able to pick the correct hardware for the DB hosts and pick the correct hardware for the application hosts. As Doug said, we initially structured them with 10 application hosts that just run Nginx and PHP FPM. Um, we have since added an 11th, that was just last week. Um, and then the DB123 hosts are running on instances which are optimized for IO and also are much larger uh, in CPU terms as well. So, and those hosts are running MySQL in a Galera cluster. They also have Redis instances and Solar instances that know how to fail over to one another in a high availability setup. Um, and there's a, a little backup host off to the side, which we is also replicating from the Galera cluster. We should adjust this diagram slightly. Um, but, and that's just a, a read-only copy. So in the event of complete disastrous failure on all three of the database hosts, we still have a backup that we could restore from, which is, is isolated from those machines. So that, that was the, the custom engineering we did on the hardware side, and we said, okay, we think we are ready to move into a testing phase. And so what we did is we looked at a number of load testing tools. We decided to go with BlazeMeter. Some of the engineers at Posh had used BlazeMeter before. And we said, we need you to write the initial JMeter scripts that will run this performance testing. Because while we know what a Drupal Commerce application looks like, their application was quite custom. Their workflows were custom. We needed their expertise to go and say, this is what a customer workflow will be. These are the pages it will hit this is what a sale experience looks like to us, okay? And, and when that was done, we would then toss it into BlazeMeter and say, okay, I want to run 600 of these at a time and, and observe what happened. And we had enough time spaced out before their <coughs> launch that we were able to do this repeatedly and evaluate in all of our load testing tools, which mostly was New Relic, but also in Blackfire um, and other monitoring to say where are the, the difficulties here. Um, Whoops, what did I do? Something wrong. No, I think your laptop's suspended. Uh oh. Yeah. Perfect. I'm clearly not exciting enough for this laptop. <laughs> um, so these are, this is a, an example that we have from New Relic on both hosts. Uh, on the right side you can see Another thing we discovered is that they under, in high load situations were crashing due to memcache becoming unavailable. And you can see the majority of the page request time there is from memcache taking really almost 80% of the request time. And that's because the memcache instances they had were not load balanced and, and simply were not enough. Um, what we discovered as soon as we put this on Redis on our side was that this actually was a bandwidth issue that the hosts talking to one another only have limited bandwidth within AWS. And with that number of requests, we're peaking at well over one gigabit per second in raw data transfer because Posh's developers had done a pretty good job and were caching absolutely everything they could, which is normally a good decision and you don't anticipate that bandwidth is going to be your problem. And so what I did is quickly threw together an upgrade to the Redis Drupal module that compressed that data and was able to then uncompress it on the fly. This has a CPU cost. We said adding CPU is easy, adding bandwidth to AWS instances is hard. We will solve the problem in the quick and dirty way. And that worked extremely successfully. So once we resolved that problem, and because we were working so closely together during this load testing phase, we were able to identify and fix that within a matter of days. Um, once we got that solved, we see that we have a much more normal request profile here with m the majority of your time being in MySQL requests to places that you would expect for a Drupal application, essentially. And we were able to knock that average time down substantially, even under very high load. Um, another thing we ran into, and this shows how the partnership was very effective, is we saw initially during the load testing that they were hitting database calls that were locking in a way that you would not normally have expected, that a particular table was being locked and that it was slowing down all of the subsequent requests. Well, as it turned out, the load testing script itself was assuming a profile that was not accurate. They were assuming that all of these requests would go to a single consultant's website rather than be distributed among their 45,000 consultants. So they were really testing as if the company was 
you know, several orders of magnitude larger than it actually is. And, and we, with multiple pairs of eyes on it, we were able to identify that relatively quickly and get that fixed. And so that sort of back and forth, almost agile process and partnership enabled us to move forward very quickly on this. So here, here's some comparison numbers. We got these from Dallas, um, who is their engineering director. Um, average time it takes, it took for our queries under similar load, went down to, you know, on the order of milliseconds, um, you know, from two milliseconds down to 0.2, eight times faster um, with Redis. Um, substantial improvements on the database layer also. Um, right, and as I talked about, Memcache had been accounting for a lot of that time. We suspect that the problem with Memcache on the other host was similar to the bandwidth problem we discovered. We don't have anything, we didn't have enough information to necessarily see that, but that is a, a strong suspicion we had. So, having gone through that load testing, we felt like we were relatively well prepared. Um, go live was on March 5th. We did a prep call for the first splurge on March 21st, and we decided we need to upsize database hosts. And for us, upsizing is a relatively simple process. Because everything is in a high availability setup, if I turn off one of the hosts, the other two respond normally. If the host I turned off happened to be the leader, that would fail over automatically. Um, so we did that. We upsized one of the database hosts brought it back up, it takes, in their setup, because they're using SSDs and ephemeral storage on Amazon, that takes about 10 to 15 minutes to sync all of the data back over to the rebooted host. Um, and then we were able to make that larger host the, the primary so it could accept reads and writes. Um, so the splurge went well. Um, we saw the, the site under severe load for roughly 17 minutes. Um, during that time, about 14,000 out of the 25,000 units sold, and then at, at that point, the site was not under any stress anymore, and, sorry? Yeah, oh, it's all here. <laughs> um, at that point, the, um, the remaining units sold out over the course of the next, I think, two to three hours um, to get through their 25,000. Uh, in comparison, the previous splurge in February was a total disaster. The site went down and could not be restored for many, many hours. Um, and, and so the, that took several days for those items to sell out. Um, the January splurge was not as bad with the other hosting company. Um, they had somewhat fewer requests per minute, but the server time to fulfill those was roughly, oh no. I don't know, oh, maybe you're not, because you're not plugged in. Oh, that could be it. Did you run out of battery? No. I think you did. Get a power brick. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Sorry, everyone. We're almost done, though. We're extremely good at DevOps, I promise. <laughs> Obviously, it's time to buy a new battery. No, not yet. No, no, no. It, we were almost done. You're killing me, I suppose. Yeah. While we're getting this back up, anyone have any questions Christian can answer while I do this? We'll do Q&A right now for a couple of minutes. Nothing? Doesn't like that. What down? Apparently not. Yeah. 
Yeah, you see what happens? Doesn't make any sense. So are you voting with those tests? No. They want me to upgrade. I think it was just graphs left, actually, right? Uh, no, there was the April splurge down, oh, so okay. it's worthwhile. Yeah. I know that off the top of my head. There, you also have it there. Yeah. What was hiding here? We're back. Sorry, guys. Perfect. Okay. Um, exactly. So with, we saw roughly 20 to 25 percent load times at both at the database level and at the server level. Just the time to get a request and to load a page had been reduced by nearly 75 to 80 percent for the March splurge. Uh, and like I said, that was about 17 minutes of very heavy load where the, the database hosts were essentially maxed out on CPU and that was the bottleneck. And we took steps to try and alleviate that, both identifying problematic queries and upgrades on our side to the database layer. Um, so approaching the April surge, we did the same thing. We upsized the database hosts and prepared for the, the moment of truth. And during the April surge, we saw much different performance characteristics. The peak request per minute went up from just above 7,000 to just above 9,000 for March. Um, their gross sales per hour went up 31% and they saw higher peak users on the site. Um, and this meant that the site was under load rather than for just 17 minutes, was under load for a full 45 minutes. And the times had gone up slightly because of this increased concurrency of requests, but they sold out all 25,000 items within that 45 minutes rather than the, the three plus hours we saw just the previous month. And so what we've seen is that immediately we saw a change in customer behavior. As soon as these customers realized that the hosting problem had gone away, now they knew, oh, we need to get in here and get these items really quickly because otherwise they'll be gone. And that, you know, we saw that and realized that we had not prepared quite adequately because under that sort of load, we saw increased performance times and so we explored additional things that we can do, um, which included increasing the pool of PHP workers, we added an additional web server, um, we asked Posh to look at a specific database query that was causing a lot of trouble, and we also added a, a new feature, this isn't on the slide, but we added a feature which allows us to load balance read requests between the three web servers, which are typically there just for high availability. What this endpoint allowed us to do is say, to the application layer, okay, use this as your secondary database within the Drupal configuration, and Drupal has the ability to point many of its queries, views in particular, at one secondary database. But on our side, that secondary database endpoint will load balance between all three of the database hosts, and so we anticipate that the next splurge will see all three database hosts under substantial load, but not the nearly the max load that we were seeing with just the one under previous circumstances. And so we feel very well prepared and we're hoping that we'll get the sale down from 45 minutes to 20 or 30 depending on customer behavior. So, all right. We have just a couple of charts um, showing bandwidth per minute. I think we peaked at about 500 megabytes per second or per minute in bandwidth coming out of Fastly and around 30,000 requests per minute from Fastly, which translated into just over 9,000 at the origin. So they were serving more requests of cached static assets and cached page frames that were then filled in with customer data after the fact. So the takeaway here is that performance is driven by, by both of these components, both what you code and how well the infrastructure is suited for it and the partnership that we have offered on the platform SH side to work with customers on the back and forth of fixing each of these issues in tandem and making progress on them together is something that has benefited Posh immensely. Um, their conversion rates, their revenue are directly tied to that performance. This is an extreme example, obviously. Most sites don't have the sort of load where they're going to crash during a sale. Um, but that's why this was such a great experience because we knew that 
the effects would be dramatic if we could solve these problems. Um, the profiling step was really important, um, being able to look and say, we know exactly where these problems have occurred and which problems we need to solve. Um, and so we leverage server-side tools to do that, both to see where the problems are and then to go back, analyze the code, optimize it, all those things. And, and so we feel like that partnership has been a benefit both to us in being able to improve our product and obviously to Perfectly Posh for being able to improve the experience for their customers. And it, it's clear to us that their customers agree. So. I actually want to go back for one second because I, I love this graph again. And if you think about it, they, we said on the other guys they were peaking at about 6,000 RPMs and then crashing. We got up to 30,000 going through Fastly. So that gives you a sense of the magnitude of the performance benefit we provided to them. And it's working still. And it's working still. So we've been able to scale it five times already within two months of going live and it's going to get better and better and better. And if you want to ask Mark, he's back there and I'm sure he'll answer a few questions for you. So he, I could even bring him up if you guys have any questions for him now. Nothing? So we are in booth 524 in the exhibit hall. If you have any questions or want to see a demo of platform, Christian is giving demos all day. Please come by the booth. Right uh, by the coffee. Yeah, and as a side note, we already host some of the largest Drupal 8 sites in the world that are live. I think we have one that's got five or six million page views a month, which isn't massive, but for Drupal 8, it's one of the largest out there, and we're just going to keep adding more and more and getting bigger and bigger. So if you guys have any questions, please come to the booth. Great. Okay.